Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, this is a long awaited time to meet with three lovely ladies who are authors and parents of uh, children with disabilities and have a huge heart for advocacy. So I think you'll really enjoy the journey of the book, uh, We Dare Be Brave. So first I wanna uh, tell you that I work for the Center for Disability Empowerment and we are a nonprofit agency. We are a community-based non-residential center for independent living that is driven by the choice and direction of people with disabilities. Um, our mission at CDE is to provide supports and resources to people with disabilities in order for them to be participants and contributors in their communities as they live, learn, worship, work, and play alongside people without disabilities. Um, my name is Deb, and I am a transition coordinator, a community connector with the Center for Disability Empowerment, and um, uh, I get to do some fun things like this. We have a lovely group of ladies here who uh, have become authors, and uh, they are parents of people with disability, and they are great friends to each other, and it's a pleasure to learn about their journey as they uh, had written the book, We Dare Be Brave. Okay, so um, what I want them to uh, do is share their stories, their personal stories, uh, how they got to be a calm and advocate, um, and who is the uh, person that led the way, and, um, and their journey and how they collaborated on this book, We Dare Be Brave. Um, this book is a long time coming. coming. Um, it's wonderful to have a focus for African American communities uh, where they can relate culturally, um, share their hearts, and then be empowered uh, to support each other and to support their loved one with disabilities through advocacy. So, this is Patricia Parker and her son Matthew. Patricia, I met Patricia, I think we met about 15, 16 years ago. Um, I'm in Columbus, she's in, in the Cleveland area, and she was uh, wanting to help her church become uh, fully inclusive. And we were both realizing at the time that um, this was a different, um, an unplowed turf, uh, yeah. especially among African American churches to uh, include people with disabilities, to have a full inclusion mindset. And um, she's had a, a very interesting and hard journey, but a really good journey as well. Um, and so she will share um, the impact of advocating Matthew and how she comes alongside with other families. Um, and that could be siblings as well, who are uh, wanting to navigate what resources are in the community and just the emotional support as well uh, as people um, go on a similar journey. So uh, Selena, you know, we talk about social capital. Uh, I met Selena through Patricia. And, uh, I, and Selena actually did teach me a lot about Zoom. Um, this is, she's with her son, Elijah. And um, uh, I think he just did a little uh, cameo earlier on. Uh, Selena uh, is a mom. And um, I asked her, after I saw a, a Zoom that she was doing with her mother to mother Facebook uh, page, I asked her if she would uh, come on and help us with the Ohio Family Network grant and talk about um, having, how to set up an online uh, social media, Facebook presentation or um, representation on uh, families of people with disabilities. And so she came in and talked about uh, how to set one up, um, how often they would meet, um, and I love the fact that they would meet the same time, the same night, because people can tap in when they need to, whether it's to get encouragement or to get um, um, support or a place to vent, which is very important among all of us. We need a, a safe place to um, share our hearts and uh, be empowered to press on. And so this is Nikki. I met Nikki, I think, through Selena, I think that. <laughs> and this is with her son, and I'm having a mental block of his name. That's Richie. Richie, thank you. It's terrible. So I'm going to start that again. So this is, this is uh, Nikki, 
and her son, Richie. Uh, my goodness, that little baby picture in the middle, he almost looks like a, a doll. Um, so cute. And anyway, so Nikki uh, is also a parent of, of, of Richie, and uh, she and her husband have both been, um, are, are being a big part of our Ohio Family Network uh, grant and uh, sharing efficacy, and her husband will be doing a father panel um, next week. So ladies, I'm a sibling, as you know, and uh, my mother was a big advocate like you guys, you would have loved her, and she would have loved you. Um, and my brother had severe DD, he was nonverbal on the autism spectrum, and he was having a lot of behavior um, issues. And, and I remember, I probably was 24, uh, I was living at home, I decided to go back to Ohio State, and she went to a meeting and she came home very discouraged. Um, she when she was sharing about, you know, the, the things that are going on at home, um, there's no respite available at that time, and wanting to get support with other parents that were there, she was criticized um, by the other, some other parents, and, and, you know, it's almost like an attitude, I got my kids stuffed together, why can't you? And one thing that she said has reminded me over the years, she said, don't they know that we're sisters under the skin? And we really are. I mean, we are for each other. We're supposed to be for each other. But, uh, you know, pride can get in the way. Um, but it's very important. And I know it's important to these ladies to, to address that. Um, and this book is just one step of them uh, walking in that path of, of reaching out to people who may feel unheard, uh, unloved, uh, unappreciated, and maybe even marginalized. So, Lady, uh, ladies, I'm going to let you take this, and I, I'll let whoever wants to start it talk about your personal journey, and then we'll talk about um, the journey for the book. Okay, well, I guess I'll start. Um, I'm Patricia Parker, and I'm the mother of Matthew Parker. Uh, Matthew is an adult. I can't hardly believe he's 30 years old. <laughs> he's an adult with autism and epilepsy. So my journey started in the early 90s. Um, it started when autism was diagnosed with one in 10,000. So I really found myself on a road less traveled. Um, my story of advocacy was just at a time where I had to constantly explain to people what autism was. Right now, mm. people have heard autism, they're familiar with it, but back then, it was constantly explaining to them what autism was and actually trying to navigate a lot of things that just did not even exist during that time. Um, while um, advocating for Matthew, it just really encouraged me that I wanted to support other families and I did not want families to have to go to, through their journey the same way that I went through mine. So what I did was I started a nonprofit called REACH and that organization is designed to provide information, education, and support to other families. And through advocating, I, I came in contact with Selena. Me and Selena go way back. Uh, we actually started back, started working with churches and developing special needs ministries. And I actually learned about Nikki and her journey of supporting other families. And so this is where all this collaboration started with me. All right, Selena. Okay, Selena, since you're, oops. Go ahead. Okay, so, so, so Selena is the culprit. You're next. And then we'll have Nikki. <laughs> uh, okay. So my son is Elijah, who you saw in the picture. He is now 16 years old. And even when I think about it, it's just like, he'll be a grown up soon. Um, our journey started when he was 18 months old. Um, I kind of noticed that Elijah was not hitting developmental milestones. And I was comparing his with his older brother, Eric, who's 20 now. Um, I noticed that Elijah was not even attempting to even speak some type of words. He was not walking. He was not doing, again, those milestones. Um, we began our journey with his doctors at that time and they diagnosed him with DD, um, developmental disability. And that's kind of where our journey began. He began to unfortunately develop other complex medical conditions, epilepsy, uh, congenital glaucoma, and things like that. Um, from there, I 
after years, you know, I knew, I always felt like I was by myself, but I didn't feel lonely, if that makes any sense. Like, I think because I'm always grinding and always going that I didn't feel like that loneliness, but I was like, man, there has to be other people out here like me, but I didn't really see them and I didn't connect with anybody. I was working for the word church and administration and I met a couple of moms there and uh, one of our elders said, you know, it's time for you to start a support group for families. And so that's where mother to mother came. And I had met Patricia before that. And I called her, I think it was some months in between. And I said, Pat, I finally, we finally got something. We finally got something. We got a support group in the church. And that's kind of where mother to mother was birthed. So we offer support resources, education to parents and caregivers. Um, like you said, Deb, we do support groups. We've done trainings. We've done events. I mean, COVID has kind of held us down, but we try to offer classes and support for families. Uh, we have a couple of things coming down the pipe. I met Nikki. Um, I had Elijah, as I said, is always in the hospital and because of his complex needs. And so I was one day and one of our two week stays saw a flyer for the Patient Family Partnership Council at UH. And I read it and I was like, wow, this sounds like what I do. I want to help other families, you know, with the whole patient experience. Mm -hmm. And so I filled out, I remember filling out the form and I got a call and they went through like this initiation, I call it, to get in. <laughs> And the final person I had to meet was Nikki. And Nikki at the time was the president of the council. And from there, we just kind of clicked. And we always said that we were going to partner. And we did. And so that's kind of how the story goes. I met Pat. Then I met Nikki. Then we all came together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and just kind of to give a quick run through of my own story. So I am a sibling as well. So my journey started when I was eight years old and my sister was born. Um, we... I definitely had practice advocating for her and helping her to navigate adult life, college life, um, navigating campus when they put snow all over the curb cuts, you know, that kind of thing and helping her to fight those fights. And then um, when my sister was 27, she passed away and she passed away 10 months after my son Richie was born. And Richie was born uh, with the same condition that my sister had had. So uh, she was definitely a mentor to me in those short 10 months and definitely gave me lots of advice that I still use today with Richie and planning for him. Uh, but I've had, you know, all almost 10 years of Richie now and worked a lot in healthcare because he spent so much time in the healthcare environment. So Richie was born medically fragile. He had a tracheostomy and ventilator and a feeding tube when he was two months old. So we always had really complicated medical care and that made me start getting involved in hospitals. So um, when we lived in Toledo, I got involved in a patient and family advisory council. We moved to Cleveland. I got involved in uh, the rainbow council that Selena met me on and eventually became the president of that council. But really, I was very interested in what the healthcare experience was like, because while ours was great, I felt like a couple doors down, I could hear families not having a great experience. And the difference was sometimes in how the nurses interacted with us and what those families did when they were frustrated and nurses and, and staff would avoid those rooms. And it always bothered me because I thought those families deserve to have the same great experience, but they don't have the skills to navigate the, that in a way that's gonna give them that great experience. So that kind of started off my work. And since then um, I started Madvocator Educational and Healthcare Advocacy Training to train families specifically on educational and healthcare advocacy. And I've had a chance to use my past experience as a teacher and an educational psychologist in that work. So all of that came together beautifully when we decided we were gonna do this book project together and really combine what we knew as advocates um, together to tell a story that would resonate with other families. Well, now you know why we have these three ladies on this panel. <laughs> um, I wish I had contact with you when I was working with younger families years ago. So I'm, I'm so thankful for you. Um, I have um, read this book, their book, and it's full of yellow highlights, making my nose. And um, what I was telling uh, the piano earlier is that uh, I love this book because it is focused um, towards African-American uh, caregiving parents and um, 
and the fact that they used you know plain language and not overwhelm you with the stuff that we hear from professionals in the field is sometimes you needed uh, something to decode what they're saying and it, it so in a sense, it makes them ineffective because they're not speaking um, our language. So, um, so whose idea was it to start this book? Um, well, I, <laughs> so Pat, Pat and I had, we used to do this thing called Real Talk, where we as parents would kind of give parents information that, let's say, uh, professionals may not share all the time. So we would give our insight and we called it real talk because we wanted to make sure that families were informed about all types of things. I remember one day I was talking to Pat about doing another real talk and she brought up, we should write a book called Real Talk. And I was like, hmm. And she had this whole outline and it was great. We said, let's contact Nikki to be the editor of Real Talk and help us with the book. And somehow we got Nikki involved and we got to talking. And Nikki, do you remember how it all got kind of meshed together when we end up doing this? To <laughs> yeah, I was like, well, I have this idea <laughs> that, that we've been, you know, I had been thinking about it for a while of coming together with other moms to write a book because my one story is not a complete 360 view of what people experience. And I think it's helpful when people can read about multiple perspectives in one place. So I'm like, I've got this idea and I think we could work together and, you know, break it up into chapters and get this thing out. But I had been inspired by the Maya Angelou poem in this book for a very long time. And when I read it to them, they were both like, yes. <laughs> so um, I think they equally found inspiration in the words of that poem. And so I think that kind of bonded us together, having the experience of hearing that poem and thinking about how it related to our lives as parents and how the emotions just stand out at you in that poem. So that's really what kind of gathered us around a theme was reading the poem together and figuring out that we could use this to convey what our lives were like and what other families should know. So I'm sure there are a lot of um, times when you needed to be encouraging to one another. Uh, maybe even some tears were shed during this process as you as you go back in time and have memories, um, you know, that are traumatic. And um, uh, I, I love that you guys do this together and I'm looking forward for future books as well. Um, but you did talk, you did talk, uh, talk about several topics in the book. Um, by the chapter, so I'm going to read them to you. Um, we talked about lo loneliness, love, pain, boldness and bravery, um, fear and timidity, freedom and moving forward. Um, so uh, who, who uh, I can't recall, who wrote, let's start with loneliness. Who, who was part of that one? I think it might be, yeah, Nikki. <laughs> <That was me>. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and actually I'll say the loneliness chapter relates to this project as a whole, that part of what we really wanted to do was make sure families knew they weren't alone. And we all had that experience in different ways. Um, Pat, where you were navigating one in 10,000, you know, and Selena, where you felt like you were by yourself in that journey. So all of us, I believe, have in common that we started this journey thinking we were kind of by ourselves. And during the process of writing, we pulled out those stories from one another. And we also kind of formed a new unit with each other too. So I think that collaboration was really fruitful because we all had something similar to share and a similar experience that we knew was somewhat universal. And no matter who reads this book, it's, it's not just for African-American women, it's by African-American women. But I feel like most of the families that we've talked to have had different messages in the book resonate with them because so much of it is universal. So those, those emotions that families feel, we all go through that. Um, I know many people have read that poem, Welcome to Holland, and that, that poem also exemplifies that feeling of not being where you thought you were going to be and then ending up somewhere else and how do you navigate. So 
really um, part of our purpose in joining forces here was to try to use the best of our experiences to relay that to other families. And I think we did um, a wonderful job of collaborating because nobody wanted to necessarily have to be out front. We were all willing to be equal partners in this. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what really good community advocacy looks like anyway, that it shouldn't be about someone trying to be out front and be seen as an advocate, but really be seen as collaborative and bringing our best gifts to the table to share with one Mm -hmm. another. And I think for me, that speaks to the loneliness aspect of it too, that I don't feel that lonely because I know I have people in my community like Pat and Selena that I can reach out to collaborate with, build something brand new that didn't exist before. And that's just exciting to be able to do. Pat or Selena, do you want to add anything to that? Um, you know what, just like Nikki was saying, I mean, you know, what we really gravitated to um, speak about was the emotional part of what we dealt with. as far as being parents of individuals with disabilities. And it was just an opportunity just to be raw and just to connect with other families and let them know, you know, and that we do understand that we've experienced these same emotions. And we talked about how to navigate through these emotions and 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 how to validate these emotions and 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 being able to say what you feel is true, you know, and, and and giving you the tools to not only identify those emotions and to work through them. So I think that was the biggest thing about this book is just being able to connect with families, not on the technical level, like you were saying, Deb, it's just so many technical books out there, but to um, connect with families on the emotional level, the day-to-day experiences that families feel, you know, as a parents with individuals with disabilities. So. Mm-hmm. I think um, also we won't, we know how busy our families can be. And so we wanted to create something again that was not a long read, that was really technical, that big words. I mean, you know, we didn't want to do that. We wanted you to be able to sit down. You can read it with within a day, a couple of days. It's a good resource book like Deb, you have yours highlighted that you can go back and refer to. And we wanted to make sure that we gave kind of like tips and things that you can take away with you. So you may feel these emotions and go through these experiences, but hey, here's a part where you could take this and apply it. And that I think is is one of the biggest things um, we really wanted to do with this book is make sure that people can walk away feeling like, okay, I have some tools in my toolbox. And another thing to add to that, Selena, is that we also wanted this to not be a pity party, right? It's <laughs> like we didn't come into this saying life is so hard because we're parenting children with disabilities. That is not the truth. The mm-hmm. truth is that we might have to spend a little more time organizing and spend a little more time planning, but our lives are just as full and joyful. Um, just as rewarding. And we also wanted to convey that, that, um, you know, I think sometimes the problem with books by parents is that they can focus on how hard it is. And yes, there are hard things. Um, We all have hard things, but we are fully um, capable of being triumphant in those hard things. And that's what I really love about the book, that it doesn't sit in those hard spaces. It tells you how to climb out of them and really get victories under your belt as a parent. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the love chapter. So (laughs) Selena. (laughs) Um, For me, I've always been, I say, an emotional creature. I think due to experiences in my life, my mom not being able to parent me like she like she wanted to because mental Ill, illness had taken her. I always said that I am going to just shower my kids with all the love and affection that I can give them because it was something that I wanted. And so I remember um, when Elijah was born and he came out with a blue eye and I we knew then that something was going on um and he ended up having congenital glaucoma and he had to have surgery like the second day of birth but it was like when he was born and even with that blue eye and even going through the love that I had for him was like I will do anything for this young man and so that love I used as a way to push me and get him what he needed um 
I made a lot of decisions that I felt was best for our family to ensure that Elijah was cared for, that he had the tools that he needs. Um, again, I think I mentioned in the book that I had to make a tough decision with my oldest son and say, hey, can he go to live with his father because Elijah's health started to change and we had to up and move. But because I didn't want to uproot him, don't th that was not an easy decision to make. That was one of the hardest decisions to say, okay, you're going to stay here with your dad. But the love that I have for my children mean that I do what is necessary to ensure that they are um, stable that they are taken care of. And so I use that love for Elijah and that that is a strong bond that we have. And it just helps me to be the person that I am today. It's pushed me to do the things that I do, advocate for him. Um, so that's a little bit of how love is patient. Even those days where he was younger and I wanted to pull my hair out, <laughs> because he was a bolter and he was a biter and he was, you know, he had typical behaviors. And even still, I remember the love that I have for him is that love is patient and it's kind and it's gentle. And those in Galatians, is it 525, Pat? I think. <laughs> but patience is a thing, is a huge, huge thing that you have to have when you have a child with a special need. And that is birth out of love. And so that is, that's a little bit on my chapter. So uh, Patricia and Nikki, do you have something you wanna add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I loved reading Selena's story about her love for Elijah and ha how that powers her work. And I think many of us will say we have similar, similar stories. As a sibling, my love for my sister continues to power the work that I do as an advocate. My love for my son um, continues to be a power behind that. And I think it's so important to focus on the positive aspects of that because it can be fuel. I mean, you can do anything for your kid if you need to. And, um, yeah. you know, giving them the best life possible is really the goal at the end of that tunnel is that you know that the love you have and pour into them and pour into their well-being is really making them um, have the best life they can have. It doesn't have to be a tough life. It can be a life just absolutely filled with love. And um, one of the, we, we've had some talks about this book and one of the things, one of the parents mentioned that stood out to me was bringing in more people to shower her child with love. And this life gives you a lot of opportunity to do that. You've got therapists, you've got um, physicians, you've got specialists, you've got all kinds of people working with your child who also grow to just love your child. And it's nice to create that community around them too. Um, and I also wanted to add too, with Matthew being 30, I, I think I had spoke about this before about how my love has evolved from for him and how my love changes as he grows older. I mean, you know, I actually see his disability less and less. I, I'm actually seeing more of his character and just his personality. And I think it's just a part of me, of him growing, him evolving and, and me evolving and how love it will change over the years as your child evolves. So, I mean, you know, so I think that's the biggest thing that, that touches me about Selena's chapter two is how love does evolve. So Patricia, don't put yourself on mute because you're on next. Let's okay. talk about the chapter on pain. Okay. You know, I think, uh, and Matthew's in the background, he's making a little bit of noises. That's why I was muting. So you might hear him a little bit. Um, I think the biggest thing is pain is about how I process pain and how I always had an agenda of just staying busy. I had this checklist. Uh, just making sure that I got everything done for Matthew and, and advocating and just navigating through the day. And in the checklist, I was really ignoring some of the things that I was needing. And so what happened was, is that um, I, I found myself um, actually at one point, um, I ended up having a panic attack because I really was not addressing some of the things that I hadn't um, identified that I needed as a caregiver. And so I think one of the things I really wanted to focus on um, in my chapter in pain is having a self-care plan, being able to identify what your needs are and being able to um, be able to take care of yourself 
and which helps you be able to be a better caregiver. So in, in my chapter, I identified um, different ways that you can develop a care plan. And I talked about well visits and I talked about exercise and I talked about um, you know, eating and just and ask, actually getting physical exams. And I looked at parents taking the time to invest in themselves and not just being a caregiver and the importance of investing in themselves. And I also talked about a little bit about counseling. Um, I think sometimes in the African-American um, community, we don't embrace uh, the resource of counseling. And that was something that I had to do um, as a caregiver. And actually counseling helped me to identify and address some of the things that I hadn't been able to do because I was so focused on being a mm -hmm. caregiver. And one of, the, one of the things the counselor said to me when I was in counseling, she said that if I was in a plane and we got into an emergency um, situation and the mask fell down, who would I put the mask on first? And I actually said, Matthew. And she said, well, after you pass out, who's gonna take care of Matthew? And that was very, very telling for me. It really helped me to, um, to, re, to look at how my caregiving was and actually reassess how I caregive for Matthew. So, so the, the chapter of pain was just a time of me examining and looking at ways that I navigated uh, caregiving and not really looking at my needs as a caregiver and encouraging other uh, parents and individuals to look at that. I want to just say one thing before I ask Nikki and Selena. Um, one thing I love that you, <laughs> you said is self-care does not necessarily mean a manicure or a day at the spa. Um, those people can't afford to do those things and they're just like quick temporary fixes for what half hour or an hour so uh, I thought that was a very fun thing to point out Deb in my journey that's called grooming I've been from the books that I read what I, I mean I was one of those I thought going to the hairdresser and going to get my nails done and doing those things I did believe that that was self-care and of course as I'm going further into that journey I'm learning that that's called grooming and that it's not self-care mm -hmm. mm, interesting myself COVID was really a good lesson for me in what self-care should look like because at the beginning of all of this last March, my stress level was way high and my number of ways to bring that stress down was way low. Um, so I've had to learn how to cushion my day with different ways to take care of my own stress. And sometimes that might be two things in a day. Sometimes that might be eight things in a day, but it's really making sure that my stress level is never so high that it's spilling over into my parenting. And I've been able to be a buffer for myself and make sure I put those care plans in place and do them every day in a way that supports my well-being overall. And I feel a lot more prepared to deal with changes. Um, you know, sometimes we have no risk. Serve. And when something changes, we are just at our wits end. And the more we care for ourselves and kind of bolster up our own ability to, to thrive, then we don't have, we don't fall prey to so many of those other pressures. So I found that over the past year, it's actually been wonderful for me to, to learn how to care for myself better. I've dropped 30 pounds, you know, I'm eating healthier. <laughs> it's been awesome. So I can't say that COVID has been all bad for me because I've been able to really put in plans that take time and allow me to care for myself in a way that makes me a better parent. Yes. Yeah, because we need you to be healthy and take care of yourself so that you continue caring for your sons and um, other people. I, I mean, those things also change in our um, stages of life. Um, you know, you know, Patricia is a little further down the road with Matthew, and so she'll bring wisdom to pass on and encourage our younger. And also, Nikki and Selena, you'll be passing it on to younger people than yourself as well. So, um, so with that, I'm going to ask Selena to talk about boldness and bravery. <laughs> I don't know why I laugh when you guys mentioned this chapter. I remember when we talked about this and I called Nikki and I'm like, I'm having a hard time with this boldness and bravery piece uh, because I've always considered what I do for Elijah just is just being a parent. 
And it's great to get a perspective from someone else because Nikki said, well, that is bold. That is brave. The How I advocate for Elijah. Um, days where I, I remember going into my first IEP meeting, terrified. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I had no idea of the terminology that they were using. I didn't know whether I had a voice, whether I was able to say something, do I just listen to them and keep going? Um, and over time, as I learned and educated myself, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to have a voice here. I'm able to talk. And I I think it may have been like the third or fourth IEP meeting I went in and I was more confident and I went in and I had my paperwork and I had everything jotted down. And I, um, in my boldness, I sat and I said, hey, I am a part of this team. I am Elijah's mother. I have a say in his education and how it is to go as well. And I am here, let's get to work. You know, it's like, let's get to work. So um, I just wanted to use this chapter to encourage families that what we do as being special needs parents, as being advocates is brave. We don't have the typical daily activities and routines, a lot of things that we exp we um, have to deal with can be on a fly, things with us can change, and you have to adapt, and you have to change, and you have to, you know, I think as Patricia has said sometimes, you have to be a forever learner, I mean, that all takes courage, and sometimes when you don't see that there are spaces available for yourself, you, you create them, so with mother to mother, there were spaces that weren't available. And so I created it. So that does take boldness and it does take courage. And I just have to be thankful for God because I don't, without him, I definitely would not be able to do anything that I do in the capacity that I do. The reason why maybe I don't feel bold and courageous is because God is carrying me and what I do for Elijah. So I don't feel you know, any kind of way, but what we do always be encouraged is that we all have that courage and that sense of boldness inside of us. Um, I think that is why God selects us as special needs parents, because he knows the gifts that he's given us and what he's put inside of us. Um, so yeah, whenever you feel like that you're not courageous, just kind of step back and look at it from a different perspective. Look at your life and your accomplishments and what you have done for your child and what you have done for yourself. And pat yourself on the back because sometimes we're just moving. Pat talked about those daily lists. We just get so used to this robotic routine that we don't really stop and celebrate we don't stop and really reflect on what we've actually done for ourselves and for our children. Um, yeah, you know what? Um, I can definitely um, agree with what Selena is saying. I mean, you know, being bold and brave is just the small things that we do every day. Just, just being committed and just going through the process and going through the advocacy and, and just working through the problems and just being there for our individuals with disabilities, just the small things can make you bold and brave. It doesn't always have to be the big things you do. Just loving mm -hmm. your child and just letting them know that you love them and just being a voice. I mean, you know, many times I'm Matthew's voice. Matthew doesn't have the expressive communication, so I'm his voice. To just speaking up for him and speaking out for him, those are all just examples of just being bold and brave. And one of the things that occurs to me is that our goal is hopefully to get our children to be bold and brave too. And I feel like I've been successful in that. Richie is a very good self-advocate and I love that about him. Um, that, you know, he has been along the journey as I've become an advocate as well. When I used to serve on Lucas County's board of DD, Richie had a chair at the end of the table and he sat right next to me as though he was a board member too. And, um, you know, everything I've done, if I've had opportunities to take him, I've taken him. And Deb, actually the first time you and I met, I was doing a seminar and yes. psychic. So, um, you know, I, I feel like if he sees what we talk about, if he sees what's important um, to kids mm -hmm. with disabilities, to their families, he knows that we're involved in these conversations and he's even present for them, then that prepares him to be his own voice as he grows up. And he is going to be a grown man with a disability who's going to need to have a powerful voice. So even now, you know, if something doesn't go right with Richie's nursing care, Richie's telling, 
um, Richie will write down a note to tell me what happened and what he didn't like. And I love that he has a voice for himself. He has a sense of what's right. He has a sense of justice. He has a sense of what excellent care should look like. And all of those advocacy skills, we can teach our children to different degrees. So whatever your child's capacity, we can teach them to stand up and speak up for themselves. And I think the important lesson in boldness is setting an example of boldness. Yes. I agree with that. Even with Elijah, um, he has more verbal communication, but he um, still, you know, struggles in some area. But because of our many stays at UH, if the nurse grabs his arm to draw his, his blood, he will stop her and tell her where the area is because it's hard to get his blood. So I was, I'm amazed that in our journey, he's picking up things or he'll let them know, like, no, you don't go there. You go here. And so he's paying attention and he's advocating for himself. That's awesome. Um, I want to just let you ladies know, uh, I just ask permission. If we go over eight o'clock, are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So we have someone who raised their hand. Uh, I'm hoping that we can wait for uh, questions with our Q&A. It's going to follow very soon. Uh, if you would be patient to wait, that would be wonderful. So, um, so, so Patricia, let's talk about fear and timidity. Well, you know, when I thought about the chapter of fear, um, I just think that that was just something that is just a natural process of being a parent. I mean, you know, there's all different levels of fear. And I think that when I experienced fear, it was just trying to navigate and being able to understand a lot of, um, understand the process and understand how things work uh, in the system for Matthew. Um, I talked about in this chapter about Matthew's first IEP meeting and how I sat there among a huge number of people and how they were just dictating to me about what Matthew was going to do. And, and um, they, were, they had even met me or Matthew before the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the meeting and they had already decided that Matthew was going to do an out of placement. Um, um, he, they actually told me we have nothing to educate him here in the school district. So we're going to send him out of placement. So they gave me three different places for me to decide where he was going to go. And I remember saying to them, I'm like, no, we've been living here in the school district all these years. And I want Matthew to stay here in the school district. And I remember them saying, we have nothing for him. And I know that I was fearful, <laughs> but yet this came out of my mouth, uh, make something. Awesome. And it actually changed the entire tone of the meeting. Um, and so I think the thing is that fear was there, but yet I looked above that fear. I looked at the needs of my child and fear no longer controlled me, but what controlled me was making sure that Matthew got what he needed. So I think when I talked about fear in this chapter, I talked about fear being managed because it, it doesn't go away, but it, but it can be managed. And what, I, what helped me to be able to manage my fear was getting information. And the more information that I got, I was able to make informed decisions for Matthew and being able to make informed decisions helped me to manage that fear. And also different, also managing that fear by understanding Matthew's disability and understanding what he needed um, and, and understanding what Matthew needed and, and um, being able to um, go with that understanding and be able to identify what he needed to be able to ask questions that helped me make informed decisions, helped me to manage the fear, even though it, it didn't disappear, it became manageable. You know, my own experience of fear really started when Richie was really young. And I actually told this story earlier today, but Richie um, at two months old, they told me he needed to get a trach. And I didn't know kids with trachs, so it was really terrifying to me. I, it seemed like it was gonna be really hard to take care of and scary and all of that stuff. And I remember um, leaving the ICU and going to call my sister. And my sister was very, she had a very dry sense of humor and she cut no corners talking. So I'm crying on the phone and oh, he's gonna need a trach. And she goes, 
you know, trachs aren't forever, right? Did anybody tell you that? And I said, no, nobody told me that. I didn't know that. So I didn't know that he could have a trach for a temporary period of time. Okay, so cool. That's good to know. And she says, and I see these moms at muscular dystrophy camp and the trach pops out and they climb over the seat and they pop it back in and they turn around like nothing has happened. So if they can do that, you can do it too. And it was just a moment that transformed the way that I thought about my role as a parent, that I was so terrified. And then here's my sister painting this picture of these like super moms. And she, she actually said that. She said, they turn around like nothing happened. They're like super moms. And it was like, it was, it was crazy to her that I didn't see myself that way, but she, and that helped me to really see myself a different way in that moment. I was absolutely terrified the first time I ever had to change a trach. Um, my hand was shaking. The nurse had to grab my hand and make me finish the act because I was that terrified. But I learned over time that you can work through that fear, that you have to work through that fear, that your love will power you to work through that fear. And then you can figure out how awesome you can be. <laughs> you know, um, I got to the point with Richie where I could change a trach with one hand. I've done it. I've, you know, I've done this thing. And um, in a moment of emergency, had to pop one out, pop one in. And you only sometimes see your own strength when it's, when it's tested that way. So I've had to fight through those fears throughout the course of Richie's life. But it also showed me what my capacity was in a way that I never would have experienced without him. That is so good. Um, I think for me, like it, the fear is in waves, but one of my biggest fears um, is Elijah when I'm no longer here and how will he be cared for and who will care for him and the importance of making sure that I can give him as, as much uh, tools and preparation um, and independent skills and things like that. And um, I think that that right there is probably my biggest fear. I think because I love him so much, just the thought of him being harmed or hurt or placed in a home. And so that's why it's important that I, at what I'm doing now is working on his future plans and who are his list of caregivers and who handles what and what's put in the will. So for me, that's where a lot of my fear comes. And the more preparation that we do, the less fear that I have. Because it's when I put the things in place and I'm like, okay, I know this is taking care of this and this. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where my fears are. So like Pat says, they don't go away, but they become manageable. Very good. So um, the last chapter, if not the least chapter, um, uh, is the subject of freedom, and that is Nikki. So I'll let you go ahead, Nikki. Well, um, you know, I, I've had to, over time, think about this journey as a parent in different ways. And I think lots of us start with that journey of isolation and feeling alone. And hopefully we are able to move to being empowered. But what I think is there's also just a huge gift in this experience. And that freedom to me is where the gift is, um, that we learn our children in such a different way. Like, I know what Richie's heart rate is when he's doing well and when he's not. I know what his respiratory rate is. You know, um, the knowledge I have of my child is intimate on a different level than it would be if I had a child who didn't have the healthcare challenges and other challenges that he has. So I think we have these different relationships and deeper relationships with our children. And there's power in that. Um, there's power in knowing them so well that you can represent their voice. Um, you know, it's, it's a process to get to the point where you see the gift in the journey sometimes but it's there if you want to look for it. And I think there's that, that freedom that we can really embody if we want to look for it. Um, we can't stay in this position where we think that this is, that disability is so you know, upsetting. Um, it's not, it's, it's, a human, it's a part of the human condition. Lots of people are disabled, like get over it, let's get this thing done. And um, that tends to be my approach anyway. Um, anyone close to me knows I'm not the friend you call when you're crying, I'm the friend you call when you need a solution and let's solve this thing. And I think that when families feel that kind of capability of solving the problems that are in front of them, that can be enormously freeing, it can be enormously um, relieving of those fears and stresses that we start with. So 
I loved getting to the point at the end of this book where we tie this together and we say, you can still do this. Um, we're, we're moms, like we're, we're regular moms who are really doing our very best to be great advocates and to open that conversation up in our own community. And this is not something that's isolated. We're not alone in this. There are many talented and thoughtful and creative parents all over the place who can be doing things to spread that love through their community and spread that acceptance of disability and all of that. So I think that's where we hope to arrive. We hope other people arrive there. But at the end of this, this is not a journey to be pitied. This can be very empowering. It can be inspiring. It can change your whole course of your life. And that is a blessing and a gift. You know, I, I definitely uh, agree with Nikki. Um, you know, Matthew's name means a gift from God. And you know what? Matthew is the reason I'm on here today. I mean, you know, Matthew has given me so much purpose. He has brought so much joy to my life. I would not change one thing about Matthew. I love him and every single part of him. So, I mean, you know, just everything that I've experienced being his mom, everything he has taught me has just been priceless. So, I mean, you know, I agree definitely with Nikki. I mean, you know, yes, there's a lot of things that, that, that my love has evolved from Matthew. And there's a lot of things I've learned with Matthew being 30 and, and an adult now, but I would not change one thing in my journey. And I mean, that's why I'm here. That's why I have this ministry of support. That's why I've met Selena. I've met Nikki. That's why I have so many, Deb. That's why I have so many wonderful, wonderful people in my life. And if I change one thing, maybe I would not be where I'm at right now. Yeah, I diddle all of that because um, I've learned going forward is to celebrate every milestone of Elijah and celebrate the miracles. Nikki's right. He has a disability. So what? Let's go. Get over it. Life still moves. Life still moves. And I know sometimes it can be difficult for, for parents to get over the fact that they child their child has a disability, but you miss out on so much when you don't. They have personality. They are kind. They are loving. They are, you know, honest, <laughs> sometimes brutally honest. But you love it because they're honest. Um, 